Hi everyone, I'm back. Welcome to part two of my 50 invitations to play, learn, and grow. For those of you who don't know who I am, hopefully you all do, my name is Teresa and I am the creativity producer and professional mess maker at the Creative Campus. I am hoping that the part two goes a little smoother than the part one did yesterday. I did bring my tea, so hopefully that will help. I'm going to recap one through 24. No, one through 25. And we're going to pick up on 26. So real quick, if you saw the part one to this video, you heard me go through some different kinds of invitations that you can use either at home or in the classroom um, to engage kids in learning and skill building while they play. Um, so number one was curi curiosity boxes or what am I game. Number two was uh, themed bingo games. <clears throat> number three was charades. Number four was discovery walks. Number five was strenu strenuous work, make-believe play, and chores. Number six was the obstacle courses. Number seven was meal prep. Number eight was chore step process charts. I said it right today. Um, number nine was task sets. Number 10 was obstacle courses. Number 11 was scavenger hunts. Number 12 was move like A. You fill in the blank. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, gross motor games, if you go back and catch uh, yesterday's live. Um, where were we? 13 was use shapes to create pictures. Number 14 was what am I bingo with questions. And I gave you a alternate use for this. Go back, watch yesterday's live, and you can see... Um, the twist that I put on that one, I think it's better than the original. Uh, number 15 was step process picture stories, which are a series of pictures that go to a task and you have to put them in the order of how you do them, such as building a snowman, raking leaves, things like that, building a cake. Um... Oh, number 16 was Build It, um, a great game for using your listening skills uh, while you use loose parts to put an object together. 17 was Where Do I Live, science game for learning about habitats and animals. Uh, 18 was uh, my section picture puzzles. Number 19 was Where Does It Live and How Does It Move? Child-Directed Stories. Could be anything from animals to transportation to uh, people. Um, number 20 was Who Does It Belong To? Uh, we I gave the example of animal body parts. Uh, you could use... Again, you can use automobiles. You could use anything that has individual loose parts. Um, another fun activity. I really encourage you guys, even though I cough a lot through it, I am so sorry. Um, again, that's what I have the tea for today. Hopefully that won't happen as much. Um, there is some really good, really great, really great uh, descriptions of the activities. I think our feed just cut out there for a second, so hopefully that's okay. I wasn't talking while it cut out. Um, 
Oh, 21 was Create a Seek and Find Storybook. Um, we tied that one into your Discovery Walks. 22 was Make Believe Play Prop Boxes. Remember I gave the fast food restaurant example? 23 was Shape Number Letter Matching Memory Games. We talked about customizing those. Number 24 was bug sorting. Remember I talked about using this in your science learning area. And number 25 was Simon Says, a personal favorite. So now we are going to pick up with 25 through, I'm sorry, 26 through 50. I'm going to read each one. I'm going to give you a little information about it and how you can use it at home or in the classroom. So 26 is what can we find in a city? I love this activity. It ties into something that I've been talking about uh, this month in my Facebook group. We're talking about long-term projects this month. Um, and what can you find in a city ties in perfectly with this month's long-term project. We are talking about Candyland Villages and Gingerbread Villages. And talking about the difference in big cities and suburban cities and country towns um, is a great social studies activity. And I absolutely love this activity. You can stretch it out a day, a week, a month, however long you want. You can tie everything into this kind of an activity. This kind of an activity does eye-hand coordination, small motor skills, um, uh, language development, critical thinking. It has everything, and I absolutely love it, and I'm so excited that I had included this in my 50 invitations list. I completely forgot about this one. So you can study everything from who lives in a city, uh, you know, what makes them different, what makes them the same, how do they get around, and then you can actually go and build your own city, which is the most fun. Um, number 20. Seven is what's your favorite form of transportation? As you can tell, I love open-ended activities. Um, so what is your favorite form of transportation opens up all kinds of child-centered discussions. You can talk about everything from helicopters to cars to boats to trains to planes, you name it. And it opens up the conversation, excuse me, about social studies and science and physics. And you can use this with um, little kids under the age of 10. You could even use this with kids the age of 10 or a little older. Um, and I love those kind of activities that you can bring multiple ages together and they work together and they they build that teamwork and when kids can uh, use teamwork together it helps build their social skills. Number 28 homes and who lives in them. We're talking about sand castles, nests, caves, cabins, castles, apartments, firehouses, you name it. Um, this is another really great uh, open-ended activity. You can do this with animal habitats as well. You can do this with uh, different kinds of, of uh, you with studying different countries, um, which would tie into cultures of different countries and why their homes are different. Uh, let's see here. Number 29, Chef for a Day. I love activities. If, if you have followed me for any length of time, you know that I love to encourage 
using cooking activities with kids. Cooking activities with kids encourage, uh, teaches science, it enforces listening skills, it uses eye-hand coordination, it um, uses their semi-large motor skills, having to stir or pour, um, a great activity. And if you have picky eaters at home, I talked a little bit about this yesterday, if you have picky eaters at home, letting them be the chef, the household or classroom chef for the day is a great way to lessen their apprehension to trying something new. Because when they have had their hand in creating a dish and then preparing that dish, they're going to be proud of it and they're going to be more willing to try it because they're going to want to show off their work. Again, I apologize for sipping as I'm talking, but if you watch yesterday's video, it is so much better than me trying to talk through the cough that I had yesterday. Um, you gotta love the winter. It does crazy things, but what can you do? You, you can't stop the snow. And I wouldn't want to if I could, because I love the snow. I think it's pretty, and it's fun. So that was number 29 with Chef for the Day. Now we're going to move on to number 30. Guys, as I'm going on here, don't forget, if you are watching this live with me, leave your comments and I will answer them. If you have any questions about invitations, um, go ahead and leave me those questions. Um, I'm here to help. I want to help you create invitations at home that get your kids involved in learning and skill building as they play, learn, and engage. Um, I firmly believe that kids, no matter their age, learn better when they can get involved in the process. I firmly believe in taking learning off the page, off the screen, out of the book. Let kids experience the lesson that you are trying to get across to them. When they can actually experience it. Not only do they remember more of the information, they enjoy the experience and it encourages them to want to learn more. So, I Spy with a Twist is number 30. And you're probably thinking, hmm, what do you mean, I Spy with a Twist? I Spy is pretty much I Spy. Well, no. What I do is I kind of turn this into a little bit of a scavenger hunt in a way, but also a learning tool. I Spy with a Twist works like this. I spy with my little eye something that starts with the letter P. Or you could say I spy with my little eye something that doesn't have any hair, or I spy with my little eye something that snorts, um, and then use I spy with my little eye something that starts with the letter P. These are all prompts to get kids to use their thinking skills of whether it's for math, whether it's what sound does something start with, and therefore what letter does something start with. Um, I Spy lends itself really well to being connected to a, um, a learning lesson, so, or a learning subject, or a specific theme like math, or, uh, science, even. You can, you know, say, I spy with my little eye something that lives in a barn, you know, so then they have to think of the different animals that live in a barn, and then the more things that you spy about the item that you're trying to get them to find helps them to come to the conclusion that you're actually thinking of. 
Number 31, science experiments. Now this is another one of those open-ended experiences. Um, so you can use your own customization for this. You can choose the type of science. You can type uh, choose the theme that you're going to tie that type of science into. So whether it's dinosaurs or it's earth science or it's you know, the weather. Um, create some science experiments based on something that we were jokingly talking about yesterday. You know, kids of a particular age like to ask a million questions a day, whether they're at home or they're uh, in a formal classroom. And if we can recall some of those questions that the kids have asked us a thousand times over, we can turn them into experiments, or trial and error learning, as I like to call it. Um, and science experiments is a really great way to do that. That's a wonderful invitation to get kids to learn about something new and uh, getting to watch something happen. So whether it's a tornado in a bottle, or how does ice form, or... Uh, something that I was talking about in the face group uh, earlier this week. The different stages of water. From wa water liquid all the way through to snow and ice. So that was 31 experiments. 32 is how does it grow. This is a loose parts exploration. Um, this works really well with plants, with trees, with food, uh, flowers, things that kids can watch. Um, you can do this with paper bags, uh, plastic bags rather, and paper towel. Where you can start off with a seed in between a damp piece of paper towel and put it in a plastic bag and they can watch it grow. You can also root plants using uh, vegetable scraps and you can root them in water. Um, it's a great long-term project that uh, kids really love to watch the progress. And then if you're doing something like rooting a vegetable then you can extend it even further and use the vegetable that you root. <coughs> Sorry, I tried. You, you can actually use the, root, the vegetable that you root in a cooking activity that extends the learning even further. So you're getting all kinds of experiences just from one itty bitty little experiment. Number 33, Go Fish Counting Game. Um, I call it Go Fish Counting Game, but it can also be... Well, we'll go, we'll go with uh, Go Fish Counting Game because I, I have the other version further down in the list I just noticed. So, you can switch this one up. You can use it at, <coughs> at your discretion. Um... But the Go Fish Counting Game is literally what it sounds like. I created, and I don't have them in front of me, I wish I did, little paper fish that had a number written on them, and I colored them. Um, I think if I had thought ahead a little bit more, I would have, instead of coloring them, I would have put the itemized representation of the number that was printed next to it. Um, to kind of guide the kids when they would uh, go to, to practice the counting. So then what you do is you offer a bucket of loose parts, whether it's, uh, you know, transportation counters or you have beans or it doesn't really matter. Whatever kind of loose parts you have around the house that the kids play and engage with. Um, and you let them fish... Pick a fish out of the pile or out of the pond. That's the go fish part. And they have to identify the number. And then they have to scoop 
Um, I use little play fish nets. They have to fish that many items out of the loose parts pond. Number 34 is another favorite of mine. I think all of these are my favorite, but I've used some of these more than others, and this happens to be one of them. Um, I have I actually create this one, and uh, it is paper dolls. Now, it, this came from an inspiration from my childhood. Kind of shows my age a little bit, but um, if you're crafty at all, uh, the, these are easy to recreate because you can use, you can cut characters out of a coloring book. Um, I happened to use my Cricut for this. Um, I had a paper doll cut out uh, cartridge. And all I did was, for my dolls, I cut out these, they looked like minions actually. They were yellow and, you know, that oval shaped. It, they were really cute. Um, if you're interested in seeing my version, leave me a comment, and I will post some pictures of those. Um, and I, so then I cut out some accessories, um, also on my Cricut. Um, I used a purse. I made a farm set, so I made some overalls for the farmer and the hat and the, the rake and the shovel. Um, I have a garden hose. I did a firefighter that's got all the firefighter equipment, the axe, the hose, the hat, the boots, the whole nine yards. This is a great activity for building language, um, critical thinking, and it's a great child-directed activity. It's a great quiet time activity um, for them to use. Um, I used to call them busy bags, like just before bed. This is something that you could hang next to their bed that if if they don't like to, you know, <coughs> settle down right away, you could give them this and it would uh, give them something to occupy their mind with that helps them settle and relax. And they think they're just playing, but it helps them relax and actually fall asleep easier. So if you have some young kiddos at home who don't, who fight going to sleep, then uh, this is a fun activity. And you can customize it. You can go out there and you can find doll, doll cutouts for Frozen, for all kinds of stuff. If you want some inf more information on that, um, I might even be willing to do it for you. Because uh, it was real quick and easy and it's fun. Um... But leave me some comments, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions. 35. I spy construction. I love doing construction and anything that gets kids to f physically engage in creating things. So... I Spy Construction was one that I used. I offered all kinds of construction materials, whether it was paper bricks or blocks or um, silly putty or um, clay. And I labeled these things um, depending on what we were working on for that particular week. Sometimes I used um, letters for letter recognition or spelling practice or um, sight word practice. Sometimes I use numbers to practice our numbers to, to work on addition, subtraction, division, multiplication. Um, and you label the loose parts, like say the bricks, with the, uh, the numbers or the letters and then they have to put the pieces together that make an equation. So they have to find two number bricks. So say the number five brick and the number six brick. And you can have them either add the five and the six, multiply the five and the six, divide the five and the six. And then the answer 
is how many loose parts they get to choose to add to the object that they're trying to build, whether it's a house, whether it's a building, whether it's a car, whatever you choose. 38. This is the one that I was referencing a few uh, activities ago, is alphabet soup. Hi, if you're just joining us, we're doing part two of our uh, invitations, 50 ways from yesterday. Uh, so we are just getting to the end of the list. If you're watching, say hello and uh, leave me your questions. As I was saying, number 38 is alphabet soup. I feel like I talk a lot about alphabet soup because I use it so often and the kids love it. Alphabet soup um, actually was not my creation. Alphabet soup was an activity that one of my students came up with. They, uh, I were in a classroom of mine and they went over and took out, I used to have a, a sensory table that I used to use for all sorts of uses. And this particular student went over and took out the Play-Doh and I generally let the kids do what they want to do as long as it's constructive. And I kind of have them talk me through what it is that they're doing or what they're creating so that I can learn from them. Um, and I watched this student take out the Play-Doh, the alphabet magnets, and uh, I used to call it our junk bucket, but it was the bucket of toys that were oddball that people would find in a place where it didn't belong and they would stick it in this bucket and then I would put them in the proper place at the end of the day. And he had all of these things on the table together and I walked over and I asked him what he was doing. And he looked at me kind of puzzled and he said, well, I'm making alphabet soup. So that's <coughs> the inspiration, that's where it comes from. So the way I use alphabet soup is I've done it a ton of different ways. I've done it the way that he did it, using loose parts and letters and uh, labeling bowls A through Z or 1 through 100 or 1 through 10. You can do it kind of however you want. Um, and asking questions about what letter does this start with? What sound does it make? And making those connections and then getting the kids to make bowls of soup. Uh, we use called one P soup, Q soup, R soup, T soup. And the ingredients became very interesting. And um, you can even like record their versions, their recipes of the the ingredients that are in their pea soup, their R soup, their tea soup, and it makes a fun keepsake. Um, so it's it's a fun activity. If you want more details on it, I actually have some examples that I can send to you. I talk about it in the Facebook group um, quite a bit. I've done it many different ways over the years. I've even made like little paper bowls, labeled them with a letter, and then used pictures and encouraged the kids to kind of combine I Spy with sorting out the, the items into their little bowls of soup. So you, you can use it all kinds of ways. I'd actually love to hear uh, the versions that you guys choose to use and, and how you put your own twist on it. Number 39 is math games. This one is a little generic. Um, I have several of them. One of my favorites is a leaf game that I made. I cut out 
little bushel baskets. Actually, this one I've used for a couple of different themes throughout the year. Um, so it's bushel baskets, and each bushel basket has a number on it. And I then Xeroxed, and, and throughout the years I have also used my Cricut to cut uh, leaf shapes, um, different sizes, different uh, designs, you know, make, make variations for them to be able to classify. So then I made a master deck to flip over or to pass out, um, kind of like a go fish game. And then um, each child takes a turn picking a card and they have to match that shape, that color, and that amount. So if they get a red maple leaf, with a number four on it. They have to put four red maple leaves in the number four bucket. Um, I do this with apples. I've done it with leaves. I think I've even done it with seashells. Seashells would be a fun one too. How are we alike and, num and how are we different is number 40. How are we alike and how are we different, again, engages those critical thinking skills. Um, you can you, you can do this a couple of different ways. You can um, offer to, uh, like Xerox or drawn images of two of the same thing, so two snowmen that have slightly different variations on them. So maybe one snowman has a red scarf and one has a green scarf. Or maybe one has a red eye and a green eye and maybe the other one has two blue eyes. And they have to catch these subtle similarities. You can um, do it, uh, uh, you can laminate your images and have them simply circle the differences and the similarities, or you can offer them the image, and you can offer them a bucket of loose parts, and have them identify and find the item that is on the image from the bucket and cover the image with it. Um, so it's it's one that you can use any way that you want, and that's the way that I like to make these activities. I know how I've used them, but everyone's different, everyone's learning style is different, and everyone's preferences are different. So I like to leave how you use the activities up to you. Number 41 is sound exploration station or sound walks. Uh, this is more of a calm activity to get kids to kind of settle down and, and relax. Maybe you use it at the end of the day um, or just before nap time. And what you're doing is you're, you're you can either provide stations along a route that will encourage the kids to engage with it and make different sounds like a horn honking or um, a rain stick or some jingle bells or you can simply go somewhere where you know you're going to hear different things maybe you are just going for a walk through the neighborhood and on a wintry snowy day like today you might hear some interesting things, and it is you can then um, document the things that you hear. You know, maybe you as the adult um, take a piece of paper and a pencil and ask them what they hear, um, or point out sounds that you hear and then ask them what they think it is, and then you can document their answers 
for later discussion and exploration of the items that they think that they've identified and see if you can recreate the sounds once you're back in the classroom or back at home. Animal classification by the way they move. So this means when you're studying animals or reptiles or, you know, any kind of, it, it doesn't just have to be animals. This could really apply to uh, cars or foods or all kinds of different things. You could put a lot of spins on this one. Um, but you're going to classify them by the way they move. Do they fly? Do they walk? Do they swim? Do they hop? Different things like that. You could, um, with transportation, do they float? Do they roll? Do they fly? Do they, you know, how do they move? You can, um, you could do that one with all kinds of things. There's too many ideas running through my head to name them all. Um, so that would be a really fun activity uh, to, to work on some sorting and some exploring. Number 43 is how can we work together to get this job done? This one is a teamwork enforcing activity. This one is also about learning a new skill set. And I love these kind of activities. So whether it's gardening or picking up leaves or construction, um, you know, sometimes we're moving rocks around or we're cutting wood that needs to be transported from one spot to another. And this is a really great way to get kids to think through the steps of getting a job done. What tools do we need? What do we have to do first? What comes next? Why do we have to follow this order? Um, you can, you know, cooking, again, there's that crazy cooking. Cooking is great with this. Um, folding laundry is good for this. Um, I'm sure you guys could come up with some other ones and maybe you could leave them in the comments for me um, so that when other people visit this live, they can see the creative ideas that we have come up with together. But that is what that one is about. Community Helper Play. I really enjoy this one. This one is, combines a bunch of different types of play and exploration and social studies all together in one. Um, dramatic play is one of my favorite things. It opens up so much for kids to explore on their own. It builds their social skills. Um, it, it gets them life experiences uh, on their own terms. So giving them, going back to uh, the live from the other day, giving them prop boxes that allows them to explore the job that someone in their community does uh, is a great learning experience. You can do this with construction, gardeners, police officers, vets, meaning veterinarians, um, doctors, bakers, you name it. Number 45, we're almost done. 45 is build a city. And this one is different than the one we talked about earlier. This one is get out the blocks, get out the workbench tools, let kids use recyclables, let the kids build themselves a city. Um, this may mean that they have to cordon off the playroom for a couple of days till they get bored with it. But let them build a city. Let them build, uh, you know, a section of a city. And let them create a story around it. It's great um, exercise. 
it uses their creativity, and they're going to feel so good about their accomplishment when it's all said and done. It's a very exciting activity. Um, number 46 is eye hand coordination activities like potato head or stringing beads or um, beanbag tosses or um, let's see. Eye hand coordination activities. There's all kinds of them. I like to do, oh, stacking blocks or um, nailing, like hammering pegs to create a picture, uh, which is a really fun activity. You can do that in tin. You can do that in, um, you can do it in tin. You can do it in like parchment paper and it leaves little holes that you can color over. All, all sorts. Sewing cards is another one. That is um, a fun activity for kids of all ages because you can make them really complicated. Uh, you could s create your own constellations if you're studying stars with sewing cards. That would be a really fun eye-hand coordination activity. Number 47 is cause and effect ex experiments. Um, we talked about science experiments earlier. Cause and effect experiments are great for things like transportation study. You know, talking about how do you make a train go? How do you make a car go? Um, thunder and lightning um, are great cause and effect e experiments. Um, so there, there are all kinds of fun experiments that you can do um, that, that explore cause and effect. And that is definitely an invitation that could turn into a long-term project uh, the more that you allow kids to get involved in the learning. Number 48, what's missing? This is a great math activity and a, a visual learning activity. Um, kind of like what we were talking about earlier with the, the snowman picture and, and the parts that are the same and different. Um, but this is, this is a hands-on activity where you can create, say, a flower with blocks, but leave the leaf off or forget to put the stem or miss a petal. You can do this with an art project. You can do this with clay. You can do this um, all sorts of loose parts ways. Excuse me, that was rude. I didn't mean to do that. I guess I'm talking too much. So sorry. Um, number 49, we only have one more after this. Social stories around completing a job. So this is child-directed stories, and you... Offer them pictures of a task that is being done, like shoveling or building a snowman or raking leaves or cooking or you get the idea. And you ask them the question, what are they trying to do in this picture? You can use all sorts of pictures for this. Um, again, another really great open-ended activity that works on their story building skills and even their writing skills. This is a great writing prompt for older children. And you get them to write a story based on what they think is happening in the picture or should be happening in the picture. And number 50. We are at the last one who does it belong to? This is an activity that you can offer, simply offer a bin of loose parts, whether it's wheels from a Lego set or 
it's um, Tinker Toy loose, the loose pieces like the little rods or the, the wheels. This is a great activity for beginning to learn about things like robots. I love this activity when we study robots um, because you're never going to get the same answer twice. You offer the loose parts and you could even change the wording from who does it belong to and instead say what job does this part do and get them to assign it to a piece and if you are studying something like robots or cars or boats or homes or whatever you could offer, set up a blank, empty box that encourages them to use the loose parts to create a boat, a home, a robot, any kind of a thing, and they're going to use their creativity and their eye-hand coordination to pick a loose part and talk about why they chose it, where it's going to go on their creation, and why. This is such a fun activity, and I'm glad it was the one that we ended with because you can do so many fun things with this. Uh, robots is one of my favorite themes to teach um, because you can... Get completely complicated with it and make them, you know, use electricity and mechanics and batteries and that kind of stuff if you're working with older kids and actually get them to move. But if you're working with younger children, simply having a creation that they have made that, that doesn't necessarily move on its own and becomes more of like a, a doll or an action hero it makes them endlessly happy because they created it. This can also be an art project. Um, for the creative kids out there like me. Uh, I try to relate everything to art, but uh, not everyone is into art so much or artistic ability. So use this activity at uh, your own decision. I hope you guys have enjoyed parts one and two of this live. Um, this is and has been 50 Ways to Use Invitations to Learn and Build New Skills. Coming up next week, I am going to do a different live series. I'm going to do my best to do the next live series all in one live. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I hope you've enjoyed these activities. If you want even more fun ideas that would be perfect holiday gifts, head on over to my website, thecreativecampusonline.com, and click on Invitations to Play Program. And there you will find 12 or more themes that give you 30 days of activities to study that particular theme. There's everything over there from robots to bugs to Candyland and everything you could think of in between. Um, all of the activities teach as you play. So you're going to work on math, you're going to work on language, you're going to work on science, and a couple of other topics. Um, these activities are perfect for kids between the ages of two and a half and ten. So head on over there if you enjoyed, though, enjoyed this and get yourself a copy of Invitations to play. The gift that keeps on giving. And remember, keep an eye out for the second part of Invitations Live. Um, I'm going to give you even more fun ideas on how to put these together and how to use them. So again, I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next time. Bye guys.